Thank you, and thank you for that great report. By the way, it was just announced that um, the governor of Puerto Rico said he wasn't going to resign to August 2nd. And people are still out in the streets because they want him out now. Now. I mean, it's so, <laughs> anyway, it's an amazing struggle. Um, comrades and friends, this talk is not going to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of all of the disgusting racist attacks, misogynist attacks, that Trump has made against the four progressive Congresswomen, women of color, Representatives Omar, Tlaib, Ocasio Cortez, and Presley, known as the Squad. Because I figure there will be enough time to discuss. You know, comrades may want to just bring out some of, you know, these um, points. And I wrote two articles that also raise some of the details. But I do want to say uh, from the onset that. These four courageous Congress people symbolic, symbolically represent the global working class. Despite their political affiliation and loyalty to the Democratic Party, the fact that their respective nationalities, Somali, Palestinian, Puerto Rican, and black, represent millions of oppressed peoples globally. And it's an inspiration really to the movement for revolutionary change that these Congress people have stood up to the biggest imperialist, you know, in the world right now. Um, and in the end, these racist attacks are not isolated from attacks on the global working class, which includes workers and oppressed of all nationalities, gender expressions, um, multi-generational, multi who are super exploited and super oppressed by the same bosses and bankers. The main point I want to make in my talk is to show that whatever form the struggle against racism may take, whether it's in the bourgeois arena, like, the, like electoral politics, or outside that arena, which most of us always hope for, as revolutionary socialists, we must be prepared to take on this fight whenever and however it rears its ugly head because of the historical, theoretical, and practical significance of the national question and its relationship to the class struggle. National oppression is a Marxist-Leninist concept that Lenin really expounded on in his book, uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, that he wrote in 1916, when he explained that nations of peoples be they of African descent, Latinx, indigenous, Arab, and more, are super exploited along with the resources of their homeland by the richest capitalist countries in order to expand the wealth and territory of the small class of billionaires who own all the wealth in society but produce none of it. This is how the world was divided into oppressed nations and, a, and, an, and an oppressor nation. Our late chairperson, Sam Marcy, wrote in his article back in um, December of 1983 called The Right of Self-Determination in the Class Struggle. And I want to quote from it extensively, uh, so please bear with me, but I really feel like, you know, he said it best. Um, I mean, Sam was really an extension of, of Lenin in so many ways, around, especially around the national question. So this is a quote from him. Of all the great domestic political problems facing the working class and the oppressed people, none surpasses in importance the relationship of national oppression to the class struggle. Indeed, one may say that it is at the heart of the basic social problem in the United States. It touches every form of social existence, every form, and no sector of society is free from it. For Marxists in particular, it is the acid test of the correctness of their general political program. It is also a test of the revolutionary integrity of the party, in particular as, the, as this is manifested in day-to-day -day practical application. Probably no one else in is no one else's theory 
so severely tested by practice as in the field of the national question. Sam went on to say, to many in the progressive and working class movement, the relationship between national oppression and class conflict appears as a choice between two supposedly contradictory phenomena. To socialists of the pre-World War I generation, and to many avowed Marxists of that period, and even of decades later, choosing or giving priority to the national question, as some put it, giving priority to the struggle against racism. Needless to say, such a view of Marxism, in addition to being an error in principle and a violation of basic Marxist theory on the national question, was mostly propounded by whites, even those who saw themselves as inherents of socialism and even of Marxism. Upon the solution of the national question may very well depend the destiny of, working, of the working class in the struggle against capitalism as well as the future of socialism, end quote. Sam talks about socialists putting their theoretical understanding of the national question into practical application, saying that it's critical because not to do so does more harm in terms of prosecuting the class struggle. Sam timed this writing, the writing of this article because of the acid test of the first presidential campaign of the civil rights leader, Jesse Jackson, whose campaign was challenging the racism of the Democratic Party, the National Committee of the Democratic Party, the leadership. Notwithstanding that the mass base of the party has many black and brown people, and they still have that, you know, that mass base today. For Workers' World Party, we view the significance of the Jackson campaign beyond its form as a Democratic Party organizational uh, form. But in essence, in its essence, it was a catalyst for black and other oppressed nationalities to complete the unfinished bourgeois democratic revolution by extending and winning for full political and social rights for black people and other disenfranchised sectors of our class. Sam stated in, this, in the same article that, quote, the national question has for centuries been covered by a plethora of lies and deceit. The intent is to convey the impression that it does not exist or if it does exist, it is being solved, or at least its significance is diminishing due to the glory and virtues of the democratic processes of monopoly capitalism, end quote. 20 years before the Jackson campaign, the black liberation movement was div divided into dis two distinct wings. The civil rights movement, which was represented which represented a bourgeois, a liberal bourgeois sector of the ruling class, which was led by Dr. King, and the revolutionary black nationalist militant wing represented by Malcolm X. While the party felt the closest political affinity with Malcolm X and his ilk, even before he left the nation of Islam, Islam we never pitted these two wings of the black movement against each other in our propaganda or in concrete solidarity because our party believed in building class unity against the common oppressor. Did we talk about what distinguishes, distinguished both? Of course we did. But we never, you know, criticized, you know, the civil rights movement because it was a mass struggle because it was, we were very sensitive to the besieged black masses in the South who were on the front lines against fascistic Jim Crow. The lesson then and now is that whenever the masses or sector of our class is engaged as they were in the 1960s or in the, 90, in the 1980s with the Jackson campaign, the forms of that struggle against racism become secondary and must be, been, must be given support, even if that support is critical, and explaining why that support is critical while showing concrete solidarity. 
If you compare the politics of the squad to the Jackson campaign, while we all know that the Democratic Party is just as much a party of big business, war, and racism as the Republican Party, the squad's politics are really to the left of the Democratic Party as they, uh, um, as they con continue to passionately defend the rights of migrants, including calling for the abolishment of ICE and the closing down of the detention centers. They're uplifting the rights of the Palestinian people to return to their homeland and also defending BDS, supporting Medicare for all. And also, uh, I think Representative Omar just came out against Trump's his, uh, attempts to cut over three million more people off of food stamps and more. And while Bernie Sanders claims to be, quote unquote, a socialist, he hasn't mentioned, at least I haven't heard, he hasn't mentioned specifically the attacks on the squad, although he has come out against Trump's racist and xenophobic language in general. Remember, it was Bernie Sanders who didn't say anything about Black Lives Matter when he ran for president in 2016. He had to, he had to be called on, you know, there had to be a protest. <laughs> you know, against him not saying anything about Black Lives Matter. The burning question now is what is next in this ongoing struggle, especially with the presidential elections just around about 16 months away. Just a few days ago, the city council in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the RNC, the Republican National Convention, is to take place uh, in the summer of 2020, they voted nine to two to condemn Trump's racist attacks, similar to the vote that the House of Representatives took last week. But again, these are symbolic, non-binding votes. Is the Charlotte City Council going to cancel con the convention just because of this vote? Hell no, <laughs> because they're depending on the millions of dollars in revenue that are gonna come into this city, which is really the Wall Street of the South. While Democrats like Nancy Pelosi may have called out Trump on his racism, she and others like her, they're not gonna go as far as mobilizing the masses in solidarity with the squad or to demand the closing of this, these horrific detention uh, camps, which they could easily do if they wanted to because they have the resources and they have an allegiance of a large sector of our class, including the trade unions. They could easily call them out and say, come to Washington, D.C., take over Washington, D.C., you know, make demands and so forth to close down the centers. Um, but, of course, the Democratic Party leadership would be afraid of a mass mobilization in the streets uh, because they're afraid of, that it will be driven to become more independent from them and more and more to the left and driven to more and more militancy. So they're not about to do that. So in closing, while we must continue to defend the squad against racism or defend any prominent figures, politicians or not, especially if they're from oppressed nationalities, we also must continue at the same time to distinguish, distinguish the party from the two major bourgeois um, uh, parties who will do and say anything to occupy the White House, the Congress, and other capitalist institutions to administer their class rule. We must continue to organize and unite to shut down the camps, to shut down mass incarceration, to shut down police brutality, to shut down all forms of white supremacy, which will all lead to a complete shutdown of capitalism to realize a socialist future. So let's continue to build international solidarity and let's build a workers' world.